What's up, world? And welcome back to another edition of I Mix What I Like here at the Real News Network. I'm Jared Ball here in Baltimore. Today, we're going to talk again with Brian Becker, who is the national coordinator for the Answer Coalition and also an organizing member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. But today, we're going to talk with him about his new book, Imperialism in the 21st Century, Updating Lenin's Theory a Century Later by the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Brian, welcome back to Thank the you. Real News. Thank you. Thanks. So let's start with that introductory broad question. Who was Lenin? Why does this book require, why does his theory on, what is his theory of imperialism and why does it require an update uh, in the 21st century? Well, Lenin was of course the leader of the Russian Revolution, the first socialist revolution, the first time where working and poor people not only seized power but held power and of course that changed the face of the 20th century. Uh, that revolution spread throughout Asia and Africa, the Middle East, Latin America. It inspired poor people to to think that they too could organize and, and change society. Uh, Lenin was also an orthodox Marxist, but uh, Marx uh, died before what Lenin described as the era of imperialism. When Marx was alive, imperialism was a policy pursued by, say, the Dutch in Indonesia or the British in India or other places. Uh, what Lenin said about imperialism is that imperialism had evolved from a policy of the major capitalist countries to a global system whereby the entire world was divided between the small handful of imperialist countries uh, into colonies, semi-colonies, and spheres of influence. And that global system had become toxic, it had become malignant because each of the capitalist economies had to continue to expand, expand production, had surpluses, had surplus finance capital, but there was no place to, to export that capital because the entire world had been divided. And Lenin said, this will lead inevitably to war between the imperialists, and that was in essence his explanation of why World War I, a, a war without precedent in terms of the, the magnitude of carnage and violence was taking place. So he wrote it in the context of World War I to explain that World War I wasn't an accident. It wasn't because the Archduke of Serbia got shot. It wasn't uh, an, an incidental phenomenon, that it was an organic feature of modern monopoly capitalism. And this was his book, uh, Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Right? right. So in other words, capitalism had gone through a free market stage. It had evolved into a monopoly capitalism. It was struggling to redivide the world because the entire world had, at that moment, been colonized. Now, you talk in this book about the need to update his theory, that he uh, was, I, I think it's fair to say, more or less, in your opinion, correct in his analysis of the day. But as Marxists need to do, they, the, the, as you also talk about in your book, Marxists don't just look to apply a strict theory of Marx or Marxism to uh, any moment. They have to adjust it for the time and the, the, the conditions that they're dealing with. So what are the conditions now that Lenin, uh, Lenin's work at the time didn't account for or requires some updating. Right. First of all, about Marxism as, a, as an ideology or as a philosophy, it's, it's dialectical materialism, meaning it's unlike a religious dogma where it has a timelessness. The Bible says, thou shall not, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in the beginning, there was the word timeless dogma. Marxism says that you derive theory based on the generalized experience of society or the class struggle and that it must be based first and foremost on facts and facts change. And Lenin says himself, uh, theory is gray but the tree of life is ever green, meaning you have to constantly understand what's actually happening. So what's the big difference between uh, Lenin's theory of imperialism and a hundred years later when we wrote the book? Uh, not the core assessment of imperialism, its malignancy, its desire for expan its drive to expansion, its domination by monopoly. That's all true, but what's different is that the world is no longer a colonized world. The world went from colonialism to neo-colonialism, and also where some of the colonies have emerged as major powers. And also what changed fundamentally after World War II was the Soviet Union was joined by other sister socialist republics in the People's Republic of China, Eastern and Central Europe, Vietnam, North Vietnam, North Korea, later Cuba. In other words, two-fifths of the planet had become socialist and became uh, the, 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 the axis of a new kind of struggle, not between the imperialists who were fighting each other for colonies, there were no more colonies, but by the imperialist world as a whole, led by the anchoring imperialist country, the United States, the only country 
the only capitalist country that had survived World War II unscathed. All the rest were in smoldering ruins. But the United States rescued world capitalism and put all of, its, all of the capitalist countries, including its defeated rivals, Germany and Japan, after a few minor punishments, directly in a united front with the United States as junior partners, not real competitors, as junior partners to fight the bigger foe, which at that time was the socialist governments, the socialist movements, the national liberation movements that were not only anti-colonial but socialist, because the victory of the socialist camp meant the absolute destruction of all of the capitalist countries. So there was a new axis of struggle. Instead of the imperialists fighting each other, they united under the umbrella of the United States leadership. That's what the UN was for. That's what the IMS, IMF was for. That was what the World Bank, that's what NATO was for. Uniting the capitalist imperialist countries, divvying up parts of the world market, cooperating, but carrying out a ruthless struggle against those who wanted to build socialism or build national liberation movements associated with socialism. So as you went to update Lenin's work, you, in your book, talk about a number of the things that he got right at the time, some of the things that, again, need to be adjusted for, for today. One of the, the uh, elements of his analysis that you, you focus on is what he said about banks. And I do want to talk about the 2016 elections and, and how banking is being brought into that conversation and what some of the candidates are suggesting be done about it. But, uh, as Lenin, but tell us what Lenin's argument was about the about banks and where they have increased power, or or how his analysis played out, and where your your book looks to take off from and uh, from that work and update it. Lenin said the briefest possible definition of imperialism: imperialism as a global system, not as a policy, was to say it is a system of advanced monopoly capitalism, with the banks at the very center of it. Lenin's analysis was that the banks and banking capital or finance capital uh, became the dominant sector of the capitalist class and that all of the industrial capitalists uh, who had in the past, say in the 19th century, been dominant were now subservient to the banks. Why? Because the banks basically, one, cont uh, had control over credit. And secondly, it, the banks knew the exact financial situation of each of the industrial capitalists, how strong they were, how weak they were. The banks could, because of the dire need for credit, also force weaker companies to merge with bigger companies. In other words, the banks became the engineers of the process of more and more monopoly. And you can see in the United States, a uh, 100 years ago, there were 300 car companies. Today, there are three. Uh, that process of monopolization has gone on in the airlines, in telecommunications, in the media, everywhere. And all of it behind the scenes, being manipulated, being organized, is bank capital. And bank capital also has to be exported. So you see all of the trade packs like NAFTA or uh, the, the current TPP. Those are not really about trade. They're certainly not about free trade. They're about investor rights, and that's uh, ultimately about the, the rights of banks to be able to dominate the trade policies of all countries, making sure that there's no obstacle, no impediment to capital. So uh, the, what Lenin said about the banks is more true today. So we would not update that except to say he identified the, the trajectory of the dominance of bank capital of Wall Street, for instance, and that that trend has proven to be more and more the case. I also want to come back to this, to this question of that you, you the, the difference between colonial policy or imperialism as a policy and imperialism as a system. I want to come back to that in just a second. But um, well, actually, let me just start there because then we'll, we'll, we'll do it that way. You you mentioned that already, but if you could just say another word or two about this difference between policy and system and where we are today. That is, where is other than what you've just said, maybe some other examples to help identify how is imperialism as a system working now as opposed to when it was a, a policy, uh, well, a century ago? I think the way to look at it, the starting point to understand imperialism's evolution, metamorphosis into a system rather than a policy, is to look at what happened in Africa. Uh, in 1884, there was a conference in Berlin. It was called the Berlin Conference. There were 13 or 14 imperialist countries. The United States, which was a latecomer to imperialism, was also present. But they took the map of Africa and they divided every part of Africa up so that there could be a peaceful division between the imperialists, not like World War I, which was a military struggle between them for colonies, but a peaceful 
uh, decision to, to, to divide Africa. That was 1884. Just real quick, how many Africans were at that table? That, that would be zero Africans. And of course, they said it was for Africa's benefit, of course, that, that had noble causes. But they took the map of Africa and literally Egypt will go to Britain. You know, um, of course, Belgium had Congo. They, but the entire, within 18 years from the 1884 conference in Berlin, all forms of African governance were eliminated within 18 years. And by, by 1902, the only independent country left in Africa was Ethiopia. So all African governance, with the exception of Ethiopia, was gone in 18 years. That's the period that Lenin says it wasn't simply a policy by this or that country, but the mad scramble for colonies led to the complete division of the world market, which then, 15 years later, led to a war between the imperialists about how to redivide the world market. So in that process replicated itself again in World War II. So what Lenin said showed that imperialism in its highest, capitalism in its highest stage was imperialism inevitably driven towards war. Now, now the United States also recognized, weirdly, what Lenin recognized. And they tried to develop a policy in 1943, 44, 45, at the end of World War II to avoid World War III because it was leading to the destruction of capitalism and the triumph of socialism. As we could see, socialism gained a great deal. It was a period of revolution because of the magnitude of violence and destruction of the old social order from World War II. So, so what the United States said, let's have the United Nation, let's have end the scourge of war, again, between the imperialists, not between the imperialists and those who they were oppressing in the third world, but between the imperialists, let's settle our differences peacefully. Let's have a World Bank, let's have an IMF. So we, the United States, who now dominate finance capital, will decide who gets the loans. We'll rebuild Europe, we'll rebuild Japan. The deal, though, is you become our junior partners. And in your junior partnership, we give you access to markets, but you allow your countries to be occupied, and you join us in the struggle against the formerly colonized people who are aligning with the socialist camp to win their own freedom. So. That was the, that's how that policy shifted. So after World War II, no more colonies, but you have a new empire, not the British Empire which count with colonies, but American Empire with a thousand military bases dominating all of Africa, Middle East, Asia, Latin America, and intending to do so forever, but blocked by the existence of the socialist camp, which could be a countermeasure. Then there was, a, in our book, Lenin, Imperialism in the 21st Century, talks about what happened in the 21st century because the Soviet Union collapsed. It was overthrown. There were frailties and weaknesses, vulnerabilities within the socialist project. And once overthrown, the United States decided, and it was clear in their, their documents, like the 1992 white paper, uh, that the United States has in, had engaged in a new stage of imperialism, which was a period of unipolar, global U.S. domination, which led to all sorts of adventures, like the invasion of Iraq, for instance, like the bombing of Libya, like in the 90s, the destruction of Yugoslavia, a multi-ethnic socialist republic. The United even just, We even just wrapped up the anniversary of the invasion of Panama a couple of days ago. The invasion of Panama. When, when, when Bush knew that the Soviet Union was weakening, they identified all the weak links all around the world, especially countries that were emerging as independent countries. Panama, they could take that out. The next year, Iraq, because they knew Gorbachev wasn't ready to fight them because the Soviet Union was coming about. Those weren't necessary wars. Those were wars of choice. It didn't start with George W. Bush. It was like the next stage of imperialism. So you have colonialism, meaning the f fully developed world, a global system of imperialism. The imperialists fight each other. Then after World War II, stage two, the imperialists unite with each other to fight the socialists and the national liberation movement. After conquering the Soviet Union or helping it implode, then they go on a new rampage, again, to reconquer all of the independent nationalist governments that had been sovereign under the protection of the socialist bloc. It was a, considered to be a, a mopping up operation. But of course, it turned out to be a fantasy because the people who were colonized didn't become anti-colonial because they got arms from the Soviet Union. They became anti-colonial because they wanted to be free people. They didn't want to be occupied. Iraq will never go back to co uh, colonial domination, nor will any of those countries. So the fantasy of this, the, the imperial hubris that went with the third stage of imperialism, actually, I believe, is becoming its undoing, which we talk about, too, in our book. And this sort of, if, if, going back to a previous question, is, is where Lenin was correct in, in mapping the trajectory of the, the, the advance of capitalism 
to where we now have uh, finance capital dominating everything through banks. Is that yes. more or less what yes. you're saying? Yes, and, and the other thing you'll see when you read Lenin's book, and our book includes the original writings of Lenin, which are very important. He ends the chapter, he said, imperialism is not only dominated by the banks in this insatiable war between imperialism to redivide the world and others redivide the colonies. He said there's also an element of parasitism. parasitism. There's another <laughs> element which is the militarization of imperialism. That militarism in essence starts to have its own life. And you can see that uh, after World War II, the United States created what was now known as the military industrial complex. Mm -hmm. There was no existing enduring military economy before World War II, but the U.S. empire said militarism will be the road by which we not only stabilize capitalism so it doesn't endure big economic depressions like the 1930s, the government will form a, a kind of welfare for, for capitalist corporations by giving them military contracts, a trillion a year at this point, that's a lot of money, but it also becomes uh, a, a way to dominate the rest of the world. So you have the United States, the last time the United States was invaded was 1812, the War of 1812. That's how we can remember it. It was just 204 years ago. And yet it has a thousand military installations and bases all over the country in 150 countries. What's that for? Not defending the United States because it's not at risk. That's to project through the exercise of militarism, imperialist domination by the banks. Banking has come up and will, is looking to come up a lot more this year in the election cycle, the national presidential election cycle here in the United States. Um, and this is something I personally, I admittedly, struggle with, how to respond to uh, what a lot of, I think, well-meaning people on various uh, um, points on the left um, are why they're supporting Bernie Sanders. You know, the Bernie Sanders has said he wants to break up the banks. He wants to challenge their role in this country. Um, yet the Party for Socialism and Liberation, of which you are a representative, has its own presidential ticket, Gloria La Riva and Eugene Perrier. I'm wondering how you, as you know, personally yourself or as, a, as an organization, are addressing this question of, your analysis, Lenin's analysis, correctly leads us to this critique of the banks. Bernie is here saying he wants to challenge those banks, yet you have your own presidential ticket running. But the, the, the fundamental difference between the Party for Socialism and Liberation and Bernie Sanders on the banks is not the critique that the banks are bad. The, the, the difference is about the solution. Breaking up the banks and making the big banks smaller banks is a fantasy. It's a social democratic, liberal, democratic, socialist fantasy. Because capitalism, as Lenin pointed out in our book, in his book, in the book we've updated, shows that it's a congenital feature of imperialism, of capitalism, to have monopoly domination and to have the domination of the banks. It's not an accident. It's not a bad policy. It's not because of Republicans. It's not because of Democrats. It's the nature of the capitalist system itself. So his program is, in essence, an attempt to reform that which is irreformable. The big banks cannot be broken up. They can be seized, though. They can be expropriated. Why should the banks, which dominate the pharmaceutical companies, that dominate healthcare, that dominate whether we have jobs or not, why should these parasites in society have access to all of the wealth where they, the, all the income inequality that Bernie Sanders rightfully talks about is being driven based on the domination of the banks? What do the banks actually contribute? 150 years ago in capitalism, they were uh, an entity that gave you a loan when you needed some credit. Now they dominate all parts of society. Should society be of, by, and for the bankers? Well, Bernie Sanders would say no, and we would say no too, but he doesn't say the hard thing that has to be said, which is the banks have to be seized. In order to seize the banks, you need a political revolution, a real revolution, because property forms have to change. Um, when we look at property, does property give up its property? Does it give up its privilege without a fight? Did the slave-owning ruling class, which was the dominant part of the U.S. capitalist class, give up its slaves? Uh, even the slave owners who might have been more liberal, you know, maybe didn't whip their slave as much, maybe had a more humane attitude, maybe they were good Christians, but they weren't going to get rid of this institution of slavery because that was the basis of their profit. It had to be broken up through a revolutionary process, also known as a U.S. Civil War, which we celebrate formally. Uh, the, the expropriation of that class property was necessary. That's why we say we are revolutionary socialists 
Bernie Sanders says, I'm a democratic socialist. Well, revolutionary socialists are democratic too, but what he's signaling is we're not really for the revolutionary seizure of the capitalist property. The reason so many people are poor in America and one out of every two people in the United States are either in poverty or near poverty, in spite of the fact that they work hard, they take care of their kids, they want the best for themselves and their, and their, and their children, the reason they're poor is the banks have all the money. It's pretty much as simple as that. Like there's a, it's, it, but you can't just redistribute wealth. You have to seize the wealth in order for it to be redistributed. Why should they be making, why should the chairman of, of JP Morgan just give himself a raise so that he's making $300 million next year? That's a million a day almost. What did he do? He made deals to shut down somebody's factory, send it to Mexico, send it to Thailand. I mean, the banks from our point of view are a criminal enterprise. So then what, from your point of view, is to be done? I mean, because as we were talking off air a moment ago, there is at least consideration strategically, tactically, given broader concerns or, or, or uh, um, obstacles to where, where you all, or where you would call for some support of Bernie versus someone else. Or, and, and, and I was thinking of it this way. I'm finding it interesting that when Obama was pushing his Affordable Health Care Act, those of us on his left who were saying we want full, free, national socialized medicine, national health care, we were told, well, we have to go in incremental steps. Uh, this is a step in the right direction, at least. We can't expect that kind of revolutionary occur you know, act to occur so quickly. Now, Obama himself, Hillary, other supporters of those two, even Bernie to an extent in his, in his defense of that act and, and it, it, by saying he helped write it, um, that they are now using its existence to work against Bernie's call for that socialized health care. In other words, the reform is now that was told to us to be, would be a stepping stone to, to something better is being used to blunt something better from actually occurring. I'm using that in my mind to draw this analogy to this whole point of what, why should we vote or why should we support that party regardless of the situation um, with this, you know, resisting this notion that, well, it's a step in the right direction. At least it's, you know, eventually then we'll get to something better. Does that, you understand where I'm going? I, I, so, I certainly so, do. I mean, let's, let's look at the health care. Bernie yeah. Sanders says Medicare for all. Obama and Clinton are attacking Bernie Sanders for being like a raging communist because he thinks people should be able to go to a doctor when they're sick. I mean, it actually doesn't take socialism to do that. Right. European capitalist countries have instituted that welfare program because they were, of course, competing with the Soviet Union, which was a close-by neighbor, which gave people all those rights. So they said, yeah, let's give the workers these rights so they don't become communists. So, but in America, none of that exists. And so you have Obama. The, the irony of this situation is that Obama came in, adopted Mitt Romney's Republican uh, economic program, um, health uh, health care program, now, that's a program that privatizes all health care and puts it all under the hands of the biggest capitalist private insurance companies who do not provide health care. They just ration health care. And they are capitalists who are involved in health care, not to make people feel better, but to make a profit. Now, when he did that, the Republicans who fashioned the program called him a communist, right. which helped us because then people started looking up, well, what's socialism? Right. And it became the most looked up word in the Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary <laughs> because of all the red baiting of Obama. But here you have Sanders coming in and saying Medicare for all, meaning like when you're 65 or if you're a military veteran, you know, the government's going to make sure you can go to a doctor. That's what it is. And he's got a modest program for that. Now, what he's doing is actually expressing the will of the American people. And when President Obama came in in March 2009, 77% of the people, according to a New York Times survey, said, we want single-payer health plan, which means Medicare for all. Not really socialized medicine, but something better than what we have. And Obama said, that's off the table. Why? He had the House of Representatives. He had the Senate. He had, it was a popular president. There was a euphoria around his, if there was ever a time for single-payer health plan, that was the moment he said it's off the table, which shows what? It shows the liberals are really just uh, like always doing the dirty work for the right wing because they, don't, they, they think, well, if we steal the thunder of the right wing, then the right wing won't attack us, won't trash us. And the right wing thinks, <laughs> no, they didn't, they, weren't, they didn't say to Obama, hey, thank you very much, let's be friends. 
they just kept up the assault against people's rights. Also, we have Trump, we have the right-wing candidates, we have even Obama and Clinton representing neoliberal policies. What does Sanders really represent? A return to Democratic Party liberalism, which the Clinton family crushed during the 1990s. Again, because they were listening to the bankers, not to the people. The bankers wanted to get rid of welfare as we know it. So Clinton says, well, we're going to end welfare as we know it in 1996. Who, who did that hurt? Seven million children in a one fell swoop. Poor kids right. taken away from having any sort of economic support. Or the fact that he had NAFTA, which gave millions of jobs over to the biggest banks and corporations so that they could be exported. I mean, it was they who banished the liberal word. Like they say, oh, Sanders is a socialist. You can never be elected as a socialist. In the 1990s, Clinton said, that's the L word. They thought you can't be elected as a liberal. So every step of the way, the people you're talking about who are attacking Sanders, the liberals, are actually the ones who have paved the way for the ascendancy of the right. The right is bold, audacious. The liberals are just capitulators, ascendant to the right wing. Sanders says he's a democratic socialist, but his program is actually old style liberalism, which in the 21st century becomes extreme communism from the point of view of the bank's propaganda against it. They don't want to give the people anything. Well, there, at least there was a conversation hosted here recently uh, with uh, sort of a mini town hall with, with Sanders supporters, many of whom said that if he doesn't get the nomination, they will not support Hillary or the Democratic Party. They should support Gloria Lariva and Eugene Perrier. Because that's the thing, at the, bottom, at the end of the day, we're very sympathetic to the movement that has developed around Sanders' campaign. We don't, we don't have a sectarian attitude about it. The fact that 68% of the caucus goers in, in Iowa say, I'm okay with a socialist president, that means something new in the United States where anti-communism had been the unofficial religion of the country since the Cold War. That's a good thing. That means people can talk about socialism. So what Sanders is doing is good, but end of the day, he says he will support whoever the Democratic Party nominee is. Now, you take those hundreds of thousands, millions of people who are supporting Bernie Sanders. If he doesn't get the nomination, he says, join me and support Hillary Clinton. But he just fought Hillary Clinton because she represents the banks, which he's right about. So why should we, in the name of party loyalty or to stop the Republicans, then support Hillary Clinton and the banks who did all the damage to the people in the first place. I mean, that's the logic, the false logic of lesser evil politics. So I would say to the people in the Sanders campaign, if you want to be true to Sanders' principle or avowed principles, and he takes you into the Democratic Party after the convention in August, don't follow him. Join the PSL campaign, Lariva and Perrier. You know what? You might, we might not win, but when you vote for a lesser evil, it's still evil. And the whole idea of Sanders is to give hope that there can be something other than evil in terms of American politics. So let me ask as a closing question you to respond to um, what is my new favorite Marxist, Marx quote found in your book that I had not seen before reading this book, or at least didn't remember. The weapon of criticism cannot, of course, replace criticism by weapons. Material force must be overthrown by material force, but theory also becomes material force as soon as it has gripped the masses. Yeah, I mean, what mean? well, what that means, what, what Lenin means is that when the people become conscious, there is no power greater on the planet. And we can see that throughout history. You know, before things start, before movements start, they seem impossible. After they've started, they seem inevitable. We knew that was coming, but of course you didn't. You can take what happened in Montgomery in 1955 with Rosa Parks. She had been not giving up her seat lots of times, and people hadn't like started boycotts. This time they did. And once they came into motion, they started to feel their power. They started to lose their fear. They started to think about the possibilities, the hopefulness of a new world. That became the most powerful force, an impossible force to stop. Could not be stopped. And that's how all revolutions happen. It's like when the, the masses of people who seem apathetic, distracted, apolitical, suddenly become gripped with possibility. For Marxism, theory is not a dogma. Theory is the generalized experience of the people's struggle. And so you learn from the past. That's why we teach history. It's the generalization. The, the, our rulers, the oppressors, don't want our young kids to know like what came before them so that each time they have to start over from scratch. 
but there's this rich history of struggle. So Marxism is really very basically not something for academics, it's something for the people. It's the theory of liberation, the theory that liberation is possible. It's not a utopia, it's not a dream, it doesn't have a blueprint for the future, but it says working folks can be in charge, working folks can be in power, poor people can run society. And, and, and that's what it means. In terms of the question of arms versus criticism, of course, we're always baited, uh, are you violent? So we have to be careful when we answer questions. Whenever we go to a demonstration, the police say, is there gonna be any violence? And we say, well, you're, the one, you. you're the ones with guns, <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. the ones with clubs, you're the ones with tear gas, Mace, we didn't bring any weapons with us, but we're always the ones they ask about weapons. But of course we do know, and Marxism does, uh, in terms of its generalized theory, recognize that, great, that the old existing powers that be normally don't give up, and we don't even know of any instance in history where they've given up their power and privilege uh, without them struggling against the people who want justice. And so when the people who are, want justice have violence imposed on them, do they have the right to defend themselves? So Marxism is always treated as, a, a, as the doctrine of violence. It really is the doctrine of self-defense by the collective mass against the oppressors who refuse to allow justice to take place and impose all kinds of violence against it. People do have a right to defend themselves. Well, for no other reason, I want people to check out your book uh, because my father was known as the Black Lenin. He looked, favored him, and because I used to hang out. You look a little bit like Lenin. Now I'm getting older, getting balder, favoring my father's get look, so you get the beard and everything. But also because his image adorned State of the Union on U Street. So shout out to DC's hip hop community. Uh, where I used to hang out. And, Very good. So, Brian, thanks again for joining thank us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us here at the Real News Network. And I mix what I like. Again, I'm Jared Ball here in Baltimore saying, as always, as Fred Hampton used to say, to you we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everybody, and we'll catch you in the whirlwind.